Welcome back everyone, this is Professor Harry. In this video we're going to finish up chapter 14 by talking about solubility, solutions whether they're unsaturated, saturated, or supersaturated. We'll talk about what's called the like dissolves like principle and then talk about the effect of temperature and pressure on the solubility of solids and gases. And then we're going to use Henry's law to calculate the solubility of a gas. Let's begin. So when we are dissolving solutions in water, we have two competing processes that occur. You have the dissolution of the solvent, so the solid that's dissolving, and then also it recrystallizing. It dissolves by the water molecules coming and bumping into it and solvating or surrounding those solvent solute particles. However, the reverse process occurs where that solute is going to fall back out of solution into the solid form. We call that precipitation or crystallization. And there's a dynamic equilibrium that's reached when the rate of dissolution is equal to the rate of crystallization. We talked about dynamic equilibrium already when discussing phase changes. And we said that for a given substance that's converting from one phase to the next, it's an equilibrium. You've got both processes that are going back and forth. We also talked about dynamic equilibrium in the context of vapor pressure. When we discussed that the vapor pressure was the gas that's above a liquid and that gas is constantly changing and dissolving and, um, and, and coming back out of solution. So when we talk about solubility this is the maximum amount of a solute that can dissolve in a given volume under a given set of conditions. So this could be an amount given in grams or moles. And we also have to specify what temperature and what pressure we're doing this at. A very common misconception is to say that solubility is the ability to dissolve. But really that's the definition of soluble. And I think that the reason why students get this misconception is because ability is in both of them. And so be very careful that you're not mixing up the term soluble for solubility. And there's a couple factors that affect solubility. As you might assume, because we're talking about it has to be at a given set of conditions, uh, the temperature and pressure will play a role. Additionally, the, the type of intermolecular forces and the strengths of those intermolecular forces also affect the solubility, the amount of a substance that can dissolve in another. So we have three categories of solutions. We can have a solution that's unsaturated, and that's where we have, we've not yet reached the solubility limit. We have less dissolved in the solution than can be dissolved total. And so for example, if we add 30 grams of sodium chloride to 100 grams of water, it's going to be unsaturated. And what that would look like is you wouldn't see you wouldn't see any solid particles floating around or on the bottom of the beaker. To contrast this, we have a saturated solution. This is a solution where we have met the solubility. It's the maximum amount that can be dissolved under a given set of conditions. And you may or may not still see some undissolved solid. So if we add in sodium chloride, 40 grams of sodium chloride to water, some of it's going to remain undissolved um, depending on what temperature we're at. And you're going to see some solid particulates in the bottom. You could change how much would dissolve and get the rest to dissolve if you added more water or most likely by heating up the solution. The final type is what we call a supersaturated solution. And this is a case where we've dissolved in more than we should be able to. And these solutions are unstable. And the way that, that, that we create supersaturated solutions is you start with an unsaturated solution. So if we take this first solution and we cool it down slowly, such that the solid part, the solid still remains dissolved in the solution. This will leave 
all of it dissolved. and a clear solution. However, these are very unstable. There's a really cool video that you can watch. Uh, the link is there on the slides here. You can watch it where it shows how they've created a supersaturated solution and then just disturb it by adding in one particulate of um, the solid and it forms and it causes all of the solid that was dissolved to come out and precipitate out. So if you were to look at three beakers, um, and two of them are clear, and one of them has solid on the bottom, we know in this case that this is saturated. But these ones, it's unclear if they're unsaturated or if they're supersaturated. And you'd have to test for that by adding in a little crystal salt and then seeing what happens. If it dissolves, then it's unsaturated. If it causes everything to precipitate out, then it's supersaturated. Let's now talk about how intermolecular forces affect solubility. We talked about this a little bit already, uh, but we want to elaborate on it now. And, and it's this principle of like dissolves like. And that's where polar solvents dissolve polar and ionic solutes, and nonpolar solvents dissolve nonpolar solutes. But when you mix polar with nonpolar, they don't actually mix. You combine them, but they don't, um, they don't form a homogeneous mixture. And dissolution or dissolving will be most probable when the intermolecular forces that are broken are similar to those that are formed. And so here's an image depicting uh, this, uh, a couple different scenarios here. So in test tubes A and B, we have water. And in test tubes C and D, we have a, a heptane. And what we can do is put a small crystal of copper sulfate which is blue, and iodine, which is purple, into, uh, into the, the, each of the solvents. And what we see happens is that we, f we, we get solid particulates on the bottom in two of the cases, but we get um, solutions with the dissolved particles in, in two of the cases. And when we examine the intermolecular forces, we know that water is polar and copper sulfate is going to be an ionic compound. Iodine is going to be nonpolar. And heptane is also nonpolar. It's just a uh, hydrocarbon chain. And so the nonpolars mix really well and they form a uniform solution, whereas the polar with the nonpolar do not mix. And it turns out that we can't just classify a given hydrocarbon chain as polar or nonpolar it really does depend on the length of that chain. And so we use a term that uh, miscible. Um, and that's where you have substances that mix in all proportions. So if you have something like cyclohexane and hexane, these are both so similar that when you mix them together, it doesn't matter how much of one you use in the other, they're going to mix 100%. You could also mix ethanol and water. And ethanol and water um, these also mix completely. It doesn't matter if you have 1% ethanol or 90% ethanol, you're going to get a, a, a complete mixture, a solution. The opposite of that is an immiscible solution, and that's where it's not soluble, hardly at all. And so here you can see an image of cyclohexane in water, and what we see is that there's a meniscus, there's a dividing line. that shows that they are not mixed. And in the ebook, it, it, we 
see that the length of the hydrocarbon chain um, affects the solubility in water and in cyclohexane. So if we take the an alcohol here on the left, such as ethanol, which is the second one, uh, we've got methanol here. But if we increase the number of chains, it becomes less polar. And what we see happens is it starts out being um, infinitely miscible, infinitely soluble, and then becomes less soluble as the hydrocarbon chain lengthens. However, we see the opposite trend. Methanol is only partially soluble in cyclohexane, but as we increase the hydrocarbon chain, it becomes infinitely soluble within cyclohexane. And so even though there is the slightly polar region, it, do, it mixes completely with, within cyclohexane. All right, let's try a problem here. Take a look at these vitamins and try and figure out which ones are going to be more water soluble or which ones are more fat soluble. And we've looked at fats in a limited context, but we're essentially fats are essentially uh, long hydrocarbon chains. And it has these regions that are, there's slight polarity, but they're mostly nonpolar. Okay? So vitamin E, what do you think? Is this going to mix better in water or fat? This one mixes well in fat. If you look at the long hydrocarbon chains, it greatly outweighs uh, the, the smaller, more polar regions. Vitamin B6. This is a water-soluble vitamin. When you compare the relative proportion of polar to nonpolar, you've got a lot of polar areas and not as many nonpolar. Vitamin A. This is also going to be a fat-soluble vitamin. Again, look at the long hydrocarbon chain. And vitamin C. This one's definitely a water-soluble vitamin. And whether or not it's water or fat soluble actually has an important uh, implication for our daily lives. Fat soluble vitamins can be stored within our body for longer periods of time. Whereas water soluble vitamins, um, and, and, the, and the reason for that is because they get stored into your, um, your fatty tissue within cell, cell walls, etc. Whereas these, uh, these do not store well, that's because they stay in your bloodstream. And so if you have excess of vitamin B6 and vitamin C, you're just going to urinate it out. Whereas vitamin E and vitamin A, they will get accumulated and you can actually get overdoses from those. All right, let's have you try this problem. Pause the video and try this on your own before moving forward. Welcome back. So we want to know which of these, we want to uh, put these in terms of increasing solubility with water. So we know that water is going to be, is highly polar. And so we want to go from low polarity to high polarity. When we look at polarity, um, you can see that molecule 1 is completely nonpolar, whereas one, 2, 3, and 4 are, partial, are going to be polar. 3 and 4 can have hydrogen bonding. But this can have the most hydrogen bonding. And so that's going to make it the most polar. And so that would get us then 1 being the least polar, 3 being the most polar. And then between these two, because the molecule number 2 has hydrogen bonding, it is going to be second most polar. So 1423 is there. And indeed, when we look up the data on the solubility, we see that that follows. Um, our uh, our prediction here. 
let's talk now. Let's talk about um, solubility of ionic solids with temperature. Before you pause the video, let's take a look at this graph. So what we what do we see generally speaking? Well, if you take a look, in the majority of the cases, most of our substances, these are all ionic solids, have an increasing slope. In other words, generally speaking, increasing the temperature will increase the solubility of a solid. And we're not going to go into depth about why we have exceptions to that rule. Uh, but we can but we do see that they exist. And so this is um, an important fact that you want to keep in mind as you're doing the different problems. Now, now let's come to this question. And we want to know if we dissolve 45 grams of potassium chlorate and 100 grams of water at 90 degrees, keep it from the water evaporating, and then cool it to 30 with no precipitate, how would we classify this? This is going back a little bit to what we talked about, saturated, unsaturated, and supersaturated solutions. So pause the video and think about this and try. All right. Well, so first thing you want to do is take a look. We're looking for potassium chlorate. Potassium is with a K. Chlorate is here. So this is potassium chlorate. We've dissolved 100 grams of water, which is what the the y-axis indicates here. Be careful because sometimes those values will be different. And at 90 degrees. So at 90 degrees, we're right here. And if we go off to the left and interpolate, we see that our solubility is just above 45. It's maybe, maybe 46 grams. So initially, it was unsaturated. Then we cool it to 30 degrees down here. And we see that the solubility here is about 10 grams. So we would expect at that point for it to be saturated. However, because there's no precipitate formed, even when there should be, that means that we have to have had a super saturated solution. Now let's talk about gas solubility. So gases always behave uh, with an inverse relationship between solubility and temperature. So in all cases, the gas solubility decreases as temperature increases. And you've seen this. If you've ever taken your soda and you've left it out at room temperature, it's the gas, the carbon dioxide bubbles, are going to leave a lot quicker than if you leave it in the fridge. And the reason for this is because at high temperature, you're giving the gas more energy. And remember when we, when we looked at the Boltzmann distribution and said, these particles are going to have enough energy to escape. Well, if we're increasing the temperature, we're broadening out that peak and giving us a higher proportion of molecules that are able to escape. So this is the same thing that we saw when we looked at vapor pressure. The, the difference here is instead of talking about the volume, the pressure of the gas above, we're talking about the amount of gas that's dissolved within our solution. The gas solubility is also affected by pressure. Although pressure does not affect the solubility of liquids or solids, and that's because they're essentially incompressible. The amount of gas dissolved, or the concentration, is proportional to the partial pressure of that gas above the solution. And hopefully that makes sense. If you have a container, we've got some water in here, and you've got a certain number of particles up above, the amount of gas particles that are dissolved is going to be proportional to the amount of the particles up above. If we take that same volume, but decrease the amount of gas we have, 
we're going to have fewer gas particles that are dissolved. That's just virtue of there being fewer particles that can dissolve. So this is really just a logical statement here. This uh, is, no, is known as what's called, excuse me, this is what's called Henry's Law. And the Henry's Law constant um, is the value is k, and this varies for each substance. Okay, and so what we see here, this is a graph of looking at the solubility as a function of the partial pressure for a variety of different gases, and we see that not only does the pressure, partial pressure, affect the solubility, but that there's also a difference in trend due to the intermolecular forces. So generally speaking, we're increasing our intermolecular forces as we go up. And therefore, we're, we're increasing the solubility. And there are some exceptions to that, but we're not going to go into depth about why that's the case. Let's try a problem here. This is just hearkening back to what we talked about with you're putting your, your uh, soda in the fridge versus leaving it out. Let's try a problem here. The mole fraction of oxygen in the atmosphere is 0.21. We have a barometric pressure listed, and we want to know what's the concentration of oxygen in the water. We're given the solubility constant. So this is going to apply the Henry's Law. Henry's Law says that the concentration of a given gas is, is equal to the Henry's Law constant for that gas times the pressure, the partial pressure of that gas. We're given Henry's Law constant, and we need to find the partial pressure. Be careful. We're given a pressure, but that's the total pressure of all the gases. To find the partial pressure, we need to use the mole fraction of oxygen times the total pressure. When we combine that with Henry's Law, we can solve for the concentration or the solubility. That gets us 2.7 times 10 to the minus 4 molar. Now let's talk about what might what's going to happen to Henry's Law constant if we change the temperature. What's going is it going to stay the same? Is it going to increase or decrease? What do you think? Well, we know that for Henry's Law, or when we look at the solubility of gases, that gases are less soluble at higher temperatures. And Henry's Law constant is given as the concentration per pressure. And so let's just say here that if our K value is equal to 10 at a given temperature, at room temperature. And then we go up to 500 degrees Kelvin. We know we're going to have a less, the gas is going to be less soluble. And so if it's less soluble, and that would mean that we'd have to have a lower concentration for the same pressure. And that means our Henry's Law constant is going to have to go down. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have questions, you can ask on Piazza in office hours or recitation. See you later.